Um, right, so, um, so this uh, work on supermetal is uh, motivated by uh, more materials, but, but uh, it's now evolving to something, uh, something quite, uh, quite, quite different, seems to take a life of its own. Um, so um, now, uh, you know, in the first two lectures, I've described a lot about the magic bullet for topology and uh, quantum geometry, and that magic bullet is direct point. Uh, so one can ask, you know, is there some magic bullet for core electron systems? Uh, so uh, it, it appears that uh, uh, strong interaction and narrow band generally favor uh, core electron uh, phenomena, and in particular, the extreme limit of uh, high density state occurs in the uh, flat band system, and density state is a delta function. Uh, so this applies to, for example, quantum Hall systems, uh, lambda levels uh, in the strong magnetic field, and it's been proposed uh, uh, in uh, twisted bilayer graphene by Alan McDonald, and that you know, really led to the beginning of all the recent uh, uh, experiments, okay. at least motivated all the recent experiments. Um, now, uh, uh, if we look at actually the band structure of uh, twisted bilayer graphene, uh, the calculation has been uh, refined uh, again and again uh, over time. And uh, this is the most recent calculations from uh, Kerseris group. And uh, taking uh, lattice relaxation into account, it has been realized that the structural relaxation is extremely important. And uh, as you can see, that at different twist angles, uh, from 1.3 degree to uh, 0.93 degrees, uh, the uh, band width uh, is uh, reducing very rapidly as a decreasing uh, twist angle. And uh, this is a plot of the denser states. And, and you can see that the, uh, by whole singularity, uh, in the lowest conduction band and in the lowest valence bands, are uh, really approaching each other. And uh, around this magic angle, uh, they are almost uh, overlapping. So this is the calculation, uh, uh, the best first principles calculation that we have so far, probably. Now, uh, on the other hand, if we look at experiments, uh, this is the uh, STM experiment from Ali Yazdani's group. Uh, this is measurement of the tunneling density of state. Uh, and indeed, you see the two pronounced my whole singularities, uh, but the energy separation are a few tens of millilitron volt. Uh, this is a, a, another measurement, uh, not tunneling density of state, but uh, compressibility uh, by the uh, capacitance measurement from uh, MIT, Ray Ashuri, and Pablo's uh, group. And this measurement was done actually on exactly the same device uh, that shows uh, superconductivity and the correlated insulator that's uh, published in the original Nature uh, paper. And again, you see that this compressibility measures uh, dn d mu, uh, which in the non-tracking limit would also correspond to uh, tensile state. But the dn d mu generally is a thermodynamic quantity as a function of uh, chemical potential. And uh, you also see these peaks, uh, the uh, whole singularities. Uh, but the, uh, again, when you see that the uh, energy separation of these uh, Van Hoek peaks in the conduction and valence bands are uh, around uh, 35 millilitron volt. So the authors noted this and, uh, uh, and made a comment that this uh, mini band width is much wider than most theoretical estimates. So, uh, so I think people are still trying to sort out what exactly uh, the band width is uh, in this twisted bilayer graphene uh, near the magic angle. And, uh, you know, in the limit of a complete flat band, uh, one would expect uh, quantum Hall type of physics uh, might be uh, extremely relevant. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if the bandwidth is important, uh, perhaps some kind of hopper physics, uh, like in uh, high temperature supernatus, uh, might be more relevant. So uh, this is, I think, uh, at the center of this, of this uh, of issue. Uh, you know, is the system more quantum Hall like Is the system more uh, hopper like so, um, so one thing uh, that uh, uh, we played around a little bit, and this really worked by uh, Bijan, Pablado Fellow at MIT. Uh, so we noted from this STM uh, measurements uh, in, in various groups uh, that the Mori uh, super lattice is not exactly, has this exact, does not exactly have the triangular symmetry. Uh, instead, it's a distorted triangle lattice. Right? So these bright spots are the uh, AA stacking regions. And, uh, and this, uh, amount of distortion has been uh, quantified uh, in this experiment, for example, from the Columbia group. And, uh, and the authors attribute uh, this distortion due to the presence of strain uh, that is slightly different on the two layers of the graphing sheets. 
Okay, so this is known as a hydro strain. So, um, so we uh, took this experimental observation as input and then calculate the uh, Mori band structure using the uh, simplest uh, continuum model, uh, but now taking into account of the presence of the hydro strain. And, uh, and this is the uh, band structure. And now you see that the uh, Mori band uh, width uh, is much enhanced. Right? The Van Hove peaks are now separate by a few tens of millilitron volt. That is uh, at least qualitatively agreement with the STM experiment. Uh, moreover, uh, we can look at the Mori band width as a function of twist angle for different amount of hydro strain. Right? And notice that the amount of strain we are uh, using here are very small. So the smallest one is maybe only 0.1%. Now, without any strain, without any hydro strain, uh, what happens is that uh, the uh, bandwidth uh, would decrease to zero at the magic angle and then uh, become finite again. So there's this non monotonous behavior of the uh, reduction of the bandwidth that really uh, defines the magic angle uh, in, in the very early days of, the, of this field. But now you see that uh, when a small amount of strain is introduced, uh, the bandwidth seems to reach a plateau. Right? It uh, doesn't have this non-monotonic behavior anymore. Uh, so this is also uh, agrees with uh, other STM uh, measurement as a function of the uh, twist angle. So it appears that uh, the, uh, how flat this band is uh, it depends a lot on uh, uh, small perturbations. Uh, so if one can uh, remove the strain, the bands may be made, uh, it may be possible to make the uh, bands more flat. Uh, while uh, in some of the current devices, uh, the bandwidth may not be as small as we initially thought. So uh, this brings me to uh, this other uh, regimes uh, that even uh, we don't have a completely flat band, uh, even when the bandwidths are finite and important, uh, we can uh, enhance correlation effects uh, by increasing the tensile state around the Fermi energy. So the states around the Fermi energy uh, may be impo more important than states far away from Fermi energy. And um, you know, uh, it has been being known for a long time that uh, Van Hoek singularity uh, leads to logarithmic divergent tensile state in two dimensions and, uh, and a lot of interesting uh, uh, theoretical results about correlated electron phenomena near the Van Hoek singularity. Uh, we generalized this Van Hoek singularity to the high order ones and here, uh, instead of having two uh, Fermi surfaces uh, uh, touch each other uh, with a finite uh, angle of intersection, we, at this high order of home singularity, you see that two Fermi surfaces touch each other tangentially, or we can have uh, more than two Fermi surfaces intersect at the same point. Uh, and these high order of singularities requires uh, tuning some parameters, uh, and uh, we think that this might explain why this uh, correlation phenomena are only seen uh, near the magic angle, for example. Um, so these are uh, strong, these are uh, high order of Hoek singularities, they have a, a stronger divergence in tensile state, uh, a power law divergence tensile state, and that uh, fits well with the uh, STM uh, experiments. And also, for example, uh, a feature of this Hoek, high order of Hoek singularity shown here is that uh, the tensile state is asymmetric with respect to the center of the peak, and you can clearly see that the asymmetry is present at the magic angle. But the same paper uh, also showed the uh, uh, that whole peak away from magic angle, and there the peak is essentially uh, symmetric. Uh, so all these uh, suggest that uh, um, these Van Hoek singularities might play some uh, some role uh, in the physics of uh, of these uh, twisted parallel graphene, and. Uh, so what I'm going to do, right, is that I'm going to take a somewhat uh, impressionist uh, point of view. This is a very uh, biased opinion. Uh, I'm going to uh, think of the, uh, uh, use this Mori systems as an excuse to study uh, uh, physics of these high order of uh, hosting narratives uh, in a more general setting, right? So this reminds me of this painting uh, uh, from uh, ancient uh, uh, China. And uh, you see all these water waves. Uh, and to me, that looks similar to this Mori. Okay, I'm going to take, <laughs> I'm going to take this, uh, this philosophy, okay? Okay, so, uh, so uh, on the theory uh, side, the reason I think that these uh, uh, Van Hoek singularities uh, and these high order Van Hoek singularities are interesting is that they represent uh, metals without uh, any length scale, without any intrinsic length scale. 
So what I mean is the following. If you take a normal metal, right, it has the characteristic scale, which is the Fermi wavelength, uh, Kf. And, uh, and you know, in a system with an intrinsic length scale, it cannot really be, uh, strictly speaking, a, 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 a critical. Right? You know, we know the critical phenomena uh, has no intrinsic length scales. Um, uh, now, there's one class of metals which has no uh, intrinsic scale, and these are sand metals, such as the uh, drag point uh, in graphene. There, you know, uh, the Fermi surface is really a point, and uh, and this leads to a lot of the uh, uh, you know uh, work on this uh, critical uh, phenomena type of behavior in uh, drag sand metals. Uh, now, uh, in two dimensions, the, with the linear dispersion, the denser state actually vanishes. Uh, so it turned out that, that uh, Coulomb interaction is marginally irrelevant. Uh, so uh, at least the long distance behavior of graphing uh, seems to flow to the uh, non interacting limit. Now, if you have a system where the Fermi energy is right at the uh, Van Hove singularity, uh, there's, a, of course, a for full Fermi surface in the full Brillouin zone. Uh, but the divergence of the density state, right, which is uh, what governs the thermodynamic property at low temperature all come from the vicinity of these Van Hove points. And uh, if we uh, look at the dispersion, the Fermi surface, just in the vicinity of these Van Hove points, we again get a scale invariant Fermi surface. So for all neural Van Hove singularity, the dispersion near the saddle point is just kx squared minus ky squared. So the constant energy contours are just two straight lines. Right? For these uh, high order Van Hove singularity, uh, the, uh, this is what the contour looks like. There are two parabolic curves that touch each other. Again, there's no uh, characteristic length scales. Right? So this allows us to you know, take a continuum limit. Right? Right? Just like when we talk about a graphene, right? there is an underlying Brillouin zone, underlying lattice. But if we uh, write down just the low energy theory, uh, it has this linear dispersion that we can extend the momentum to infinity. Uh, similarly, in the systems uh, with these supermetals, uh, the, if we just look at the dispersion uh, in the vicinity of these saddle points, and then we can take the momentum, uh, range of momentum to infinity, we get a theory uh, without any uh, length scales. Right? So this reminds us again of the critical phenomenon. Right? So that these uh, super metals uh, uh, in some sense are uh, 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 critical. So, um, so now I'm going to uh, study basically the uh, uh, effect of electron interactions. Uh, in this kind of a, a supermetal. And again, now we're going to look at a, a, a different system. So uh, remember that in uh, twisted body graphene, uh, the Van Hove singularity occurs uh, away from time reversal point. So they come in pairs, k and minus k. Uh, so it's, it's more complicated. There are multiple high order Van Hove singularities uh, related by time reversal symmetry right at Fermi energy. So here, instead, we study a simpler model, a simpler model which ha only has a single high order uh, saddle points at Fermi level. And, um, and uh, to, to be concrete, uh, let's consider a, a type binding model, uh, a single band type binding model on a, a square lattice. But now uh, let's make the uh, hopping in the x and y direction to be in equivalent. Uh, and uh, we also add a second neighbor hopping in the y direction. Uh, and the, the detail of this Dispersion doesn't matter. You can add any terms you like. All I want to say is that whatever dispersion you choose, by tuning one parameter, you can uh, get a high order saddle points right at this uh, zone boundary at momentum pi zero. Okay, uh, and uh, at this high order saddle points, the two Fermi surfaces uh, touch uh, parabolically, tangential to each other. <laughs> and if you look at the density state, it has this divergence uh, with exponent. Uh, e to the minus a quarter. Right. So there's a Van Hove singularity at the y point. These are high order Van Hove singularity. There's another ordinary Van Hove singularity at the x point. Okay. So, um, and this model uh, might actually be relevant uh, to, for example, strong team rule snip. And uh, there's now a lot of uh, focus of Van Hove singularity uh, in this material. And by applying uni axial strain, uh, one can actually move the Van Hove singularity to Fermi energy. Uh, but only one of the two Van Hove singularities, at, for example, uh, zero pi. Uh, and this is the density state uh, plot from the calculations. And you see that there's a, a strong uh, density state divergence uh, coming from the Fermi surface in the presence of strain. And this divergence uh, is very close to the 
power law divergence at the high order Van Hoeft invariant. Okay, so um, so then uh, this brings us to the question: uh, What happens to these uh, supermetals uh, at the low temperature in the presence of electron interactions? So we know that uh, uh, without interaction, uh, as we change the chemical potential, uh, there is a topological transition of the Fermi surface. Uh, the system changes from hole type to electron type. And now the question is, uh, what happens uh, when uh, interaction effect is present? Uh, what happens uh, at the low temperature? So there are various possibilities. Uh, broadly speaking, two types. Uh, the first is that the system might be unstable to uh, symmetry breaking. Uh, and for example, ferromagnetism, uh, onematicity, uh, superconductivity, or density wave. And uh, this uh, scenario has been widely explored uh, in the context of ordinary Van Hoeft singularity in cuprates. Uh, in uh, ruthenates, uh, in single layer graphene, uh, as well as in more recently in twisted body graphene. Uh, and also, there is a very nice work by Claudia Chamon uh, studying a model of high order Van Hoeft singularity, uh, multiple high order Van Hoeft singularities with multiple types of interactions. And again, generically, in that case, the system becomes unstable to certain uh, symmetry breaking. So, I'm going to now uh, focus on a different scenario. That uh, uh, these supermetal may remain metallic down to zero temperature, okay? And it turns out this is a case uh, for uh, a single high order Van Hoeft singularity in the range of interactions. So, uh, so first, let's uh, look at the uh, uh, mean field phase diagram for this situation of a single uh, high order Van Hoeft singularity, right at Fermi energy, or uh, we are going to more generally we're going to look at the phase diagram as a function of chemical potential and the interaction strength. And uh, so what is plotted here uh, is the uh, density uh, of the system of ground state and the uh, magnetization of the ground state, the spin polarization of the ground state uh, that's obtained from a mean field uh, calculation. Uh, and as you see that, you know, for example, for a given uh, finite interaction strength as a function of uh, increasing chemical potential, uh, the system uh, always becomes ferromagnetic, okay, in a range of chemical potential when the Fermi energy is close to the high order Van Hoeft singularity. Uh, now, now, this transition to ferromagnetism is actually first order. Uh, and at the same time, with this ferromagnetic transition, there's also a discontinuous change of the uh, electron density. Okay, so this is consistent with the fact that these high order Van Hoeft singularity are right on the verge of ferromagnetism, because it has a diverging spin susceptibility. Uh, it's also on the verge of becoming a, 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 a charge ordered, uh, because it also has a divergent uh, charge compressibility. Right? So when interactions are present, uh, there's a, for mean field calculation, there's a first order transition to ferromagnetism and to charge separation as a function of chemical potential. And uh, this discontinuous change in magnetization and in chain, uh, carrier density, in electron density, uh, become weaker and weaker as the interaction strength uh, get smaller. Okay. Now, when the interaction strength approaches zero, uh, this region of ferromagnetic region uh, shrinks to a single point. Right. And and this is because when you have a divergent density state in mean field calculation, infinitesimal interaction uh, will be able to uh, uh, give uh, ferromagnetism. Right. But uh, but the region of ferromagnetism also becomes vanishingly small. Okay. Is it, is it any questions? It's clear. So, uh, so now what we're interested in is uh, uh, how is this mean field calculation uh, going to, uh, uh, to, to change when we take fluctuations into account? Right? This is very much like critical phenomena. Right? So in the critical phenomena, uh, what we tune is, for example, temperature. Uh, <laughs> in the presence of, uh, and, and we look at, you know, for example, how the system changes from uh, disorder state a paramagnet to a, a ferromagnet as we change uh, as we lower the temperature, right? And uh, in the absence of interactions, uh, this transition uh, is uh, uh, exactly described by just the mean field theory. But in the presence of interaction, in the presence of these uh, nonlinear terms, uh, the nature of the transition may be modified. Right? So here, there's this exact analogous. The chemical potential uh, is the analog of the uh, temperature in the uh, 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 five-four theory, while the interaction is the analog of the uh, five-four term in the uh, in the um, five-four theory. 
So, um, so, uh, so then let's now uh, to study these uh, uh, effective fluctuations. We now uh, uh, look at uh, this, uh, this this full theory, which has a uh, high order by whole singularity. Uh, the dispersion is quadratic in one direction, uh, is quadratic in the other direction, uh, and mu is chemopotential. And now let's add a contact interaction, right? It's point interaction between uh, spin up and spin down electrons. Um, so we now we're going to uh, you know, uh, treat this as a quantum field theory right? and uh, uh, analyze the, uh, the its behavior using renormalization group method. So uh, and again, uh, the this it, it's possible to use this uh, renormalization group method because uh, the Fermi surface is actually scale invariant. Right? There's no intrinsic scales, so this gives us a chance that the system may flow to an actual quantum critical point. And um, right, so this is you know really this theory is really a, a fermionic analog of pi-four theory, right? So there is a quadratic term and there is a quadratic term, and we know that in the absence of interactions, this chemical potential mu is relevant perturbation. We drive the system into either electron fermi liquid or hole fermi liquid, and now the question is what about uh, uh, interactions? So. Uh, uh, you know, uh, one way to control the RG flow is to introduce a small parameter uh, in Wilson feature theory uh, for phi four theory. Uh, this is we use a dimensional uh, as a parameter, the so-called dimensional expansion. Uh, so we can do the same thing here. So uh, the dispersion is quadratic. The problem we are originally interested in uh, is a two-dimensional system where the dispersion is quadratic in one direction, quadratic in the other direction. And this leads to a density divergence, which is with exponent the mind, uh, a quarter. Uh, now we can extend the problem, uh, generalize the problem. For example, there are uh, d1 directions in which the dispersion has exponent n1, uh, n is integer, and there are uh, d2 directions in which the uh, uh, dispersion has exponent n2, and this gives the density state divergence uh, with an exponent which is given by this, right? So one minus d1 divided by n1 minus d2 divided by n2. So imagine that instead of having one direction where direct, the, the interaction is uh, quadratic, uh, imagine there are two directions in which the direction in which the exponent the, the, the energy dispersion is quadratic, then this epsilon becomes zero, right? So this allows us to play this trick of dimensional expansion, that uh, uh, in treating this d two as two minus epsilon, uh, we can control the density of state exponent, and we will see that uh, this uh, density of state exponent. Uh, plays a role of a small parameter that controls the RG flow. So, um, so then uh, what we do is uh, we again follow the spirit of the uh, Wilson RG. Uh, we uh, impose an energy shell uh, in momentum space, uh, and we progressively integrate out modes that uh, uh, lie uh, at the edge of this energy shell. Right? We thinning degrees of freedom, and we uh, change our variables. And we try to bring the uh, action back to self. And uh, in the process of doing that, the parameters in the theory uh, would have been changed. And this allows us to keep track of the, uh, uh, the RG flow. And uh, uh, at the tree level, uh, this is, uh, the theory is completely a uh, quadratic theory. Uh, the high energy degrees of freedom and the low energy degrees of freedom are completely separate, uncoupled. Uh, uncoupled. So, uh, in order to bring the cutoff back, we have to rescale momentum in this way so that the frequency, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we change, uh, perform a change of variable so that the, the uh, cutoff goes back to self. And this imposes uh, these transformations on the frequency, momentum, and the fermion fields. And uh, it also changes the uh, coupling constant g. So uh, the consequence of this is just that the contact interaction is uh, relevant, uh, but high, any high order interactions containing uh, any derivatives are irrelevant. Right? So when epsilon is small, only the contact interaction is uh, relevant. And this makes sense, right? because we know, for example, uh, if the density state has a logarithmic divergence, then the contact interaction is actually uh, marginal. Right? So uh, when the density state is barely power law diverging, uh, only the contact interaction is, is relevant. And uh, uh, so again, this is very similar to the structure of the Wilson Fisher uh, theory for phi four, phi four theory, right? In the phi four theory, below the upper critical dimension, uh, the phi four term is relevant, right? 
So then uh, we do the go to the one loop level. Uh, in the one loop level, uh, the injection is going to be uh, receive corrections from two uh, processes. One is a particle hole process, and the other is a particle particle process. Right. So this particle hole uh, process, uh, in, if we do an RPA treatment, is what gives rise to ferromagnetism, and the particle particle process is what uh, leads to screening. Right. So in the presence of repulsive injections. Uh, this screening uh, tends to reduce the interaction strength. And uh, if when we look at uh, this uh, problem in the RG approach, uh, we see that uh, uh, we're going to uh, need to include uh, these two uh, diagrams into account. And uh, again, uh, I want to uh, mention that uh, in general, the allowed interactions uh, of this form, uh, in, there's a four fermion term. And uh, one, two, three, four uh, really labels the uh, frequency and the momentum of these uh, on the incoming legs. Um, but again, uh, we can expand this interaction function uh, in powers of the momentum, and only the zeroth order term is relevant. Okay, this is another way of saying that we only need to uh, think about the contact interaction because any uh, uh, additional interactions uh, are uh, irrelevant or at the tree level already. So, um, so when we uh, look at these two diagrams, it turns out that the particle diagrams uh, gives a zero contribution uh, when the external momentum and frequency are set to be zero. Uh, and what this means is that uh, at zero temperature, there's really no particle hole screening uh, from states near the energy shell uh, lambda. Right? So um, on the other hand, the particle-particle uh, process uh, is present, and uh, it tends to decrease the repulsive interaction. So uh, the uh, uh, upshot of this is that uh, if you look at the RG flow of the coupling constant, uh, at the tree level, it's uh, relevant. But then there, at, uh, at the one loop level, there is a G squared term with a negative coefficient. Okay? Uh, another effect of the interaction is that uh, it actually shifts the uh, chemical potential. Uh, uh, again, this is the structure of these two equations are, are, are very similar to the 5 4 theory. Right? So again, chemical potential. Uh, uh, plays a role of temperature in 5 4 theory, uh, and the Gaussian fixed point uh, uh, corresponds to the non interacting uh, supermetal, while the Wilson Fisher fixed point corresponds to uh, interacting supermetal. And, uh, and you clearly see that uh, from this RG uh, flow, there is a fixed point right, at finite uh, interacting strength. And uh, we would like to understand uh, the properties uh, at this interacting fixed point. And, um, and for that purpose, we we'll need to uh, compute uh, these all these uh, uh, susceptibilities uh, at this uh, interacting fixed point. And these susceptibilities are governed by the scaling dimension of relevant operators. Uh, and uh, these are the various uh, relevant perturbations. Uh, mu is the chemical potential. H is the uh, external field. And the delta is the uh, external pairing field. Right? And uh, so if we look at the uh, response to a chemical potential, this tells us about the charge susceptibility. Okay? Uh, the scaling dimension of mu uh, determines the charge susceptibility. The scaling dimension of H, uh, external field, depend, uh, determines the spin susceptibility. And turn out to one loop level, uh, they, the, they diverge with exponent epsilon, which is a non interacting intensive state exponent. So at the one loop level, uh, the interaction, at the interacting fixed point, these are. Uh, these exponents are unchanged. However, uh, if we look at the pairing susceptibility, okay, uh, when we compute the uh, scaling dimension of the of, of the pairing uh, field, it actually acquires a uh, correction due to the interactions, and the pairing susceptibility actually uh, is non-divergent. Okay, so this delta operator is actually uh, uh, irrelevant at the uh, interacting fixed point. So this is very different from the non-interacting. Case, right? In the non interacting fixed point, uh, the uh, external um, magnetic field, the, the Zeeman field and the pairing field, all have the same scaling dimension uh, because the spin susceptibility and the pairing susceptibility all diverge uh, as a denser state. Okay? But here at the interacting fixed point, the pairing susceptibility is totally different from the uh, spin susceptibility. Right? So this already tells us. That this interacting fixed point is not a uh, Fermi liquid. Um, one can actually. An yeah. Intuitive description of 
why that happens? Yeah, this actually is not quite surprising. So in a sense, uh, even for uh, a, um, a, f a system with a finite Fermi surface, uh, the pairing susceptibility, uh, in the presence of interactions, the pairing susceptibility does not have a log divergence anymore. They become finite. Yeah. Because they're repulsive. They're repulsive the interaction, exactly. Yeah. Now, what about the long range part of the coulomb? Yeah. Right. So, so I'm also. This? Are you going to get to that? Or? No, I'm not. Yeah. So, so you, I'm, know, you <laughs> right. don't know what So I assume that there are other parts of the Fermi surface which already screen the long range coulomb interaction. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh -huh. right. But you can't treat that systematically. Uh, not, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Right. Not yet. Right. Okay, so, uh, right, so, uh, so right, from, from this uh, uh, one-loop calculation, uh, uh, we can already see that uh, the system uh, is not a Fermi liquid. Uh, now, uh, the uh, gold criterion for deciding whether it's a Fermi liquid or not is to look at the uh, quasi-particle weight, right, which corresponds to uh, the scaling dimension of the fermion fields. This actually requires a two-loop calculation. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's something I didn't appreciate before. <laughs> Uh, if you, in the same way, if you look at the 5-4 theory, right? If you look at all the textbooks, like the Chicken Lubansky textbook, uh, you know the textbook will tell you everything about all the critical exponents except the announced dimension of the fields, of the boson fields phi. And the textbook always says that this requires beyond the one loop calculation. <laughs> so, so, uh, so yeah. So here we have a similar situation that uh, uh, we can get the uh, susceptibility of all these, uh, all these uh, relevant operators. Uh, right, susceptibility from the scaling dimension relevant operators, uh, but right if we are right at the critical point, right, the only exponent uh, left right at the critical point is the uh, uh, correlation function of the fermion fields, right, and that defines the enormous dimension. So this requires a two-loop calculation, and uh, uh, Hiroki, uh, you know, really did this heroic work. Uh, at least to me, uh, looks heroic. Uh, and the thing is that uh, with two-loop calculation, it cannot be done. Really, it cannot be done uh, in any straightforward way uh, in the Wilson RG approach. So one has to use this field theory RG. So anyway, so uh, so uh, so Hiroki developed that scheme for uh, our problem, and uh, it showed that uh, the fermion fields has a uh, indeed has an enormous dimension uh, at uh, uh, the two loop level, and uh, it's uh, <coughs> proportional to the uh, critical interaction strength squared. So the interaction strength uh, at the fixed point is a border epsilon. I should mention that that uh, yeah because of this structure, right, this epsilon here. Uh, at the uh, interacting fixed point, the uh, g is a border epsilon, so this uh, enormous dimension of the fermion fields is a border epsilon squared. Okay, so this tells us that the quasi-particle weight actually really vanishes. So uh, basically, to, uh, to, to uh, so what we get is that uh, uh, when we uh, use this uh, uh, renomination group approach, this quantum field theory approach, we show that uh, basically uh, if we have a scale invariant Fermi surface with a power law divergent intensive state, with local contact interactions, it leads to a non Fermi liquid uh, uh, state, uh, a non Fermi liquid fixed point. And uh, our analysis is uh, fully controlled uh, in the same way that the Wilson Fisher fixed point is controlled. There's a small uh, dimensionless parameter uh, uh, which is related to the density state exponent epsilon. And in, even in the original problem we are interested in, epsilon is a quarter, so it's already quite small. Uh, also, I want to make a comment that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Scale invariance really plays a, a crucial role here. Uh, for an ordinary uh, uh, non-metal, which has a characteristic KF, uh, very often at low temperature, uh, uh, instability occurs. Uh, for example, the, the most famous one is this Tonnettinger mechanism. Uh, and uh, that is related to this 2KF uh, non-anticity of the susceptibility. But if you have a situation where the KF is absent, there's no characteristic scales, then this Tonnettinger mechanism does not apply. Right. So this is exactly what happens in our situation. The Fermi surface has no characteristic, has no intrinsic scales, um, and you know also uh, you know other approaches to non-Fermi liquid it requires some singular interactions, uh, that is made, for example mediated by gapless uh, uh, bosonic excitations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, while here, right, well, we're really starting from a fermion uh, system uh, with just local interactions, and uh, uh, you know it's not because interactions are particularly singular, but because the dense state. Is singular that these two is uh, non-Fermi liquid state. So now we can uh, put everything together to look at the uh, whole phase diagram, right? So as a function of the uh, chemical potential and the function of interaction strength. So this is the mean field phase diagram. Uh, there is a uh, when interaction is weak, uh, there is an electron Fermi liquid, whole Fermi liquid, 
separate by a small region of ferromagnetism. Right? Uh, however, when we take uh, the fluctuation into account, uh, this mean, phase, mean field phase diagram is going to be modified uh, in this region. Right? This is the region where the interaction strength is small, chem potential is very close to the Van Hove singularity. Right? So instead, what we have is that, uh, 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 that there is a, a, a line uh, over which, uh, instead of becoming ferromagnetic, the system remains uh, metallic. Uh, this is a supermetal state, uh, interacting supermetal state, and only above a critical interaction strength, the system becomes uh, ferromagnetic. So there is a, uh, a fixed point uh, that along this line, which is this uh, this fixed point. So, so that means you're saying there's a second phase transition of higher. There's the a second phase transition that's higher. Any, yeah. Do you have any way of treating that system? Not really. Not, not really. We have some thought. You know, we have to form. You know, I think it cannot be treated by just using the fermion. I mean, I, maybe one has to formulate the problem as fermion coupled to some some you know order parameter field. Yeah. So so yeah. You know, I I cannot. Uh, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so also one can uh, take an even broader view. Uh, in addition to these two parameters, g and mu, remember that to obtain the high order Van Hove singularity in the first place. We have to tune the dispersion. Right? The more general case is that in the system uh, we have uh, an ordinary Van Hove singularity. Uh, only when you tune some parameters, uh, such as the twist angle, uh, you can turn a high, uh, ordinary Van Hove singularity into a high order Van Hove singularity. And if you go past this, the system uh, will, be, you know, a high order Van Hove singularity splits into two ordinary Van Hove singularity again. Right? So this is this kind of changing of the uh, dispersion is represented by additional parameter lambda. Right. So in this overall phase diagram, uh, what really happens is that this uh, this supermetal state, right, interacting fixed point, is really uh, a multi-critical point. One needs to tune two parameters to reach it. One has to tune the chemical potential to the right place, and one needs to tune the uh, the, uh, the the lambda, right, the, the changing the dispersion uh, to the right place. Right. So in the presence of interactions, you know, these original non-interacting dispersion can be modified. RG can generate additional terms to the non-interacting dispersion, but the, the key point is that by adjusting one uh, tuning parameter lambda, one can always reach this uh, fixed point. Okay. So it's a it's a multi-critical point that requires uh, tuning two parameters. Uh, one is the uh, the chemical potential, which is controlled by the carrier density, by the gate voltage uh, in the Mori materials, and the other is a knob that changes the uh, the dispersion. But only if we need to tune one such uh, tuning parameter, uh, we can reach this power of saddle points. So, uh, and that I think is an advantage of these modeling materials that that uh, we can always uh, use gating to bring the chemical potential to a desired fitting, and on top of that, one can one can you know play with electric field etc. to to tune the uh, the system. Okay. So uh, so this is basically the, the end of the first part of this talk. Uh, any any questions? So I want to make a yes. So you mentioned this is the case for only uh, one higher event hope similarity. Right. Exactly. Yeah. What happens when you have multiple of them? Right. 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 Excellent. So, uh, right. So I was just about to make that remark that uh, all this is for the case of a, a single higher event hope. Uh, when there are more than one event hope similarity right uh, at Fermi energy, uh, uh, which is the case for twisted by graphene, uh, and uh, 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 it seems that generically the system actually would flow to a symmetry breaking state. So instead of uh, remaining metallic down to zero temperature, uh, some kind of an order sets in. And again, a very nice work is uh, by Claudio Chamon, uh, dealing with the high order Van Hove singularity. Uh, and uh, we also look at the case, for example, uh, of uh, ordinary Van Hove singularity when there are multiple of them. Again, uh, when there's uh, interactions uh, between different Van Hove uh, points, uh, the system uh, seems to flow to a, a symmetry breaking state, such as a dense wave or superconductivity. So this uh, example that I've just shown, uh, as far as I know, is the only example where uh, the Van Hove points can lead to a, a non-fermi liquid down to zero temperature. Yeah. Right. Excellent question. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me see now. Uh, move on to the next part. So uh, how much time do I have? Uh, we have until ten forty-five. Okay. I may end a bit early. So uh, okay. <clears throat> All right, so now uh, let's talk about this, uh, uh, this uh, another. Uh, so, so far, you know, uh, I've been uh, taking a, a weak coupling approach, right? So, uh, in this one whole scenario, 
you know, for example, uh, uh, you know, when infection is weak, right, we get an infecting fixed point. Uh, this infection strength measured uh, in the units of cutoff is of order epsilon. Epsilon is the density of state exponent, right? So uh, all this uh, physics happens uh, in a sense at weak coupling. Uh, and uh, now what, what happens, you know, when we uh, look at strong coupling limit, right? So in reality, these moral materials are, are, are probably an uh, intermediate coupling when the induction strength is comparable to the bandwidth. That's the most difficult uh, regime. So, uh, you know, as theorists, we can explore the weak coupling uh, limit and explore the strong coupling limit and hope, hope they, they, they can tell us if, uh, something useful uh, and hope we can extrapolate between the two limits. Um, now, in the strong coupling limit, you know, the natural, uh, uh, one, one natural starting point is to uh, start with the Hubbard model, right? This is a, a, a par a paradigmatic approach to strong correlations. And uh, it, it turned out for twisted ballet graphene, right, that uh, a, a Hubbard model uh, has a very interesting features. And we will probably hear more about this in the afternoon. And uh, here, all I want to say is that uh, uh, we look at the twisted ballet graphene uh, with this uh, particular lattice structure. And uh, we found that uh, this uh, system is actually described by a Hubbard model on the honeycomb lattice, where the sites of the honeycomb uh, are the ABBA regions. Now, what, if you look at uh, the STM experiment, for example, shown at the beginning, uh, the, right, all these uh, uh, regions of high tunneling density of state are in the AA region, which form a triangle lattice. Right? So uh, the density of state are concentrated in the AA region, and yet, uh, from the analysis of the band symmetries, uh, we infer that the one year center has to be on the honeycomb uh, site. So the, uh, to reconcile these two conclusions, uh, what happens is that when we explicitly construct the uh, one year function in this work with uh, Kaushino, uh, it, it turned out that the one year center is at the uh, ABBA region, but each uh, one year function uh, consists of uh, of, a, of a three pieces, right? Has three peaks, right? Which are actually centered in the uh, AA region. This is AB, this is AA. Right. So it's a very uh, 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 interesting feature. Um, and, uh, uh, and these three pieces of the one function, they have a, a relative phase. They have phase winding relative to each other. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so uh, the punchline is that uh, uh, for twisted body graphene, uh, a uh, a uh, Hubbard model uh, description uh, is, uh, let's say, twisted, uh, twisted, is sophisticated. Uh, so, uh, but on the other hand, uh, for all these other Mori systems, uh, like trilayer graphene on HBN, uh, for twisted uh, transition metal dichacarcinides, uh, over a wide parameter range, uh, these are really described by a simple uh, Hubbard models uh, on the triangle lattice. Okay? So, in these systems, there's an analogous A stacking region and uh, uh, the uh, one year orbitals are centered in these uh, triangular uh, lattice sites. So this allows us to construct in a straightforward way a uh, Hubble model on the triangle lattice. Now one uh, generic feature in these systems is that uh, uh, unlike the uh, Hubble model for cuprates, uh, there are two orbitals uh, involved here. And these uh, two orbitals really come from the presence of two values. Uh, so, uh, you know, remember that in graphene, right, there are these two values. And when you form a, a super lattice, uh, when you form a Mori, these uh, two values uh, remain essentially uh, decoupled at the single particle level. So that's why the low end de degrees of freedom comes from both values. And these two values uh, are uh, represented by the, the two orbitals in this Hubbard model. So, um, so in particular, let's focus on this uh, ABC uh, trilayer graphene on HPN uh, that you heard from uh, Feng Wang uh, yesterday. And uh, uh, so uh, this system uh, consi consists of the three ingredients, right? Uh, the first is that there is a trilayer graphene, and that provides us with these uh, low energy electrons. And, and you, if you remember that trilayer graphene, the low energy dispersion has a cubic dispersion, right? Right at the um, uh, K points. And um, a, a second ingredient is that electric field, uh, which uh, is again is, is not, which can tune the bandwidth, and, and uh, it not only tunes the bandwidth but also uh, modifies the dispersion of the Mori band, which again is uh, what 
can give rise to these uh, high order of housing similarity, etc. Uh, and the, the final ingredient is this uh, boron nitride substrate. And because of the lattice mismatch, this boron nitride uh, provides a Mori uh, super lattice uh, potential. So essentially, what we're dealing with is uh, uh, electrons in uh, bi graphene uh, moving under the presence of a periodic potential okay, from the HBN. And so this type of uh, band structure has been solved, uh, you know, calculated uh, in this uh, phone one's uh, paper. And you can see that there is a narrow band, right, narrow band here. And uh, as you heard yesterday, that uh, as a function of the carrier density and uh, in a certain range uh, of the electric field, uh, the, you see that there's an insulating state when the, when the Mori band is partially filled. At one half filling and a, a quarter filling, insulating states both appear. And we think that this half filling state uh, uh, can be understood already from the recoupling approach uh, because of these uh, high order Ranholm singularity. On the other hand, for the quarter filling, uh, there's nothing special onto the Fermi surface. So to understand the physics at the, this quarter filling insulating state, we have to turn to the strong coupling approach. So um, uh, this, uh, the, so this is the rest of this talk is about this uh, this quarter filling state uh, in this trilogy. Um, so uh, again, if we take the type binding model, the Wannier functions are centered uh, in the uh, uh, AA stacking region, and uh, they form a triangle lattice. Uh, and there are two uh, orbitals coming from the two valleys, and uh, the system has a three-four rotation symmetry, uh, time rotation symmetry. Uh, which interchange the two valleys and uh, reflection symmetry. So, um, so in this triangle lattice, we can introduce the nearest neighbor hopping, second nearest neighbor hopping, and these are the dominant hoppings. Uh, one thing to notice is that uh, because electrons in each valley uh, is not time reversal invariant, right? time reversal symmetry interchange the two valleys. So within a valley, there's no time reversal invariance. So this means that uh, when electrons of a given valley hop on the triangle lattice, it can pick up a uh, flux. Right? The hopping uh, is, uh, can generically be uh, complex, right? very much like the uh, Hodane model. And, and indeed, uh, uh, based on symmetry, uh, the first neighbor hopping is allowed to be complex, uh, but the second neighbor hopping uh, turns out has to be real due to a reflection symmetry. I'm not going into the details. Uh, so we are, end up with a two orbital hopper model on the triangle lattice uh, with hopping, complex hopping T1 and real hopping T2. Uh, it turned out these two hoppings are uh, the largest, so we can neglect the rest. Uh, and uh, for the interactions, we use the simplest uh, on-site uh, Hubbard interaction, right? That uh, give an energy penalty for uh, deviation from having one electron. Right? It only uh, depends on the total number of electrons per site. And um, so, with constant initial rate, with uh, with here, uh, we studied the physics of this Hubbard model, uh, two orbital Hubbard model with complex hopping. Uh, on the triangle lattice. So uh, I'm now going straight to the strong coupling limit. Uh, at the quarter filling, there's uh, this Hubbard induction U guarantees that uh, there's only one electron uh, per site. Uh, then uh, there's a virtual processes of uh, electron hopping between uh, uh, nearest neighbor sites, second neighbor high sites, and that generates the uh, spin uh, orbital exchange interaction. Right? So by a T over U expansion, uh, what's shown here are the two kinds of uh, exchange processes. Uh, in the first type, we have uh, electrons on two sides uh, within the same valley. So this exchange process uh, does not depend on any uh, any uh, flux. Does not depend on the flux because electron hops forward and then backward, right? And uh, the, the two processes have opposite phases, so they cancel each other. On the other hand, you can have uh, uh, electrons. Uh, on different uh, values you know, or different orbitals in this representation. And in the end, uh, uh, when the two electrons are exchanged, uh, the phase factors, they do not cancel, but they add up. Right? <coughs> because remember that the two values are the time reversal conjugate of each other, so they carry opposite uh, flux. So in this case, the hopping uh, picks up a flux. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, this is the form of the uh, exchange interaction. Uh, and uh, let me explain what it is. Uh, at every site, uh, there are four possible states. Right? Electron can be in valley plus or minus. It can be in spin up or spin down. Right? So these four states are uh, labeled by this alpha or beta. 
and this T operator is just uh, 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 this, this, this exchange operator, right? It's an uh, exchange state alpha to beta and vice versa. Uh, the nearest neighbor exchange interaction uh, has a phase factor, right? Uh, and the second neighbor uh, exchange interaction uh, is real, okay? So when the phase factor is uh, zero, uh, this exchange model uh, Hamiltonian has a manifest SU4 symmetry. So uh, in the absence of any uh, valley flux, the valley and the spin, you can group them together into a four component uh, uh, degrees of freedom and the exchange Hamiltonian is SU4 symmetric. But when the valley flux is uh, non-zero, uh, so valley and spin degrees of freedom are inequivalent. Right? There's a full spin rotation symmetry, but uh, for the valleys, there's only a valley U1 symmetry. So that's why the uh, full symmetry uh, in the presence of the valley flux is, uh, uh, is SU2 cross SU2 cross U1, so the two SU2s refers to a spin rotation symmetry within each valley. And the U1 represents the valley number conservation. Right. So this, this is a full symmetry of this problem. Is there an estimate of how big that flux is? Uh, yes, I'm not showing it here, but actually uh, in the, uh, you know, Noel can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so I think for, the, uh, for this, the valley flux depends on the applied electric field and for the, um, uh, for, we did some estimate. For this particular electric field strength, the valley flux is of order uh, pi over 2, I think. On the order okay. of pi over 2, it's pretty large. Yeah. And uh, microscopically, this valley flux uh, uh, comes from this uh, trigonal warping uh, of this uh, energy dispersion in trilegraphy. Right. So this is the way time reversal symmetry uh, is broken. Uh, time reversal symmetry, you know, within each valley, if, if you have a k to minus k symmetry, then uh, there's no valley flux. But even in trilographene, there's already a trigonal warping. So within each value, the dispersion is not k minus k symmetric. And this trigonal warping is actually amplified by uh, HBN uh, superlattice potential. Right. Now, uh, on the other hand, uh, for, it turns out for, uh, for twisted TMD, for twisted uh, TMD, uh, the uh, trigonal warping is much smaller, and this valley flux is very small. Yeah. So that's why for the twisted TMD, this SU4 symmetric model is a good starting point. Okay, so uh, so um, so now uh, uh, you know with this uh, exchange model uh, in the strong coupling limit, one can uh, study its uh, ground state. Uh, we take the uh, most mundane approach, right? This uh, uh, semi-classical ground state, assuming that uh, the ground state is a product state, right? And uh, we try to uh, basically uh, 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 you know basically this 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 V represents uh, the, how the spin is polarized in spin and valley space at every site. And uh, then we calculate this potential value uh, uh, using this product state. Uh, now what's interesting here, and, uh, uh, and uh, this is really a uh, constant thing to our work, uh, is that uh, uh, interestingly within this semi-classical approach, the uh, ground state is, uh, the semi-classical, uh, the energy right, is completely minimized. Now every bond energy is minimized uh, when the ground state takes this pattern, okay. Uh, so before I explain this pattern, I want to just, uh, make this point clear that if you take, for example, a, 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 a spin one half Heisenberg model, model on the uh, square lattice, right? Uh, the semi class of ground state is uh, anti Fermanian state, right? Spin up on A sub lattice, spin down on B sub lattice, and in, in this ground state, the energy is minimized for every bond within this classical uh, approach. But if you take a triangle lattice with a spin one half electrons. Uh, the semi-classical ground state is this 120 degree state uh, where electrons um, uh, form uh, this pattern, right? So in this case, the uh, ground state <coughs> energy uh, for every bond, right, that's not, is not saturated because the best situation is to put two electrons uh, exactly opposite to each other for a given bond, right? Uh, but because of the frustration, right, that not all bonds can be satisfied at the same time, so that's why the compromise is that uh, uh, this 120 degree state is the uh, semi-classical ground state. Here, we have a situation uh, which is just like the uh, Heisenberg model on the time <coughs> lattice, right? So one might think this is actually a frustrating problem that the ground state uh, energy uh, is not saturated every bond. But interestingly, because uh, this is a two orbital Hubbard model, okay, there are four possible states to choose from. Uh, it's possible, and this is shown here, uh, it turned out that uh, uh, the ground state energy is uh, minimized at every bond. 
Okay, so it's a, actually a frustrating free problem. And uh, and you know, to be uh, to look at it more carefully, uh, to explain this a little bit more. So if you look at this uh, exchange model, exchange Hamiltonian, right? What it does is it wants to flip the states on sides i and side j, right? It exchanges the side uh, the states on side i and j, and the uh, interaction is j1, j2 are repulsive. So a ground state uh, uh, is uh, energy is within the semi-classical approach, the the uh, energy is minimized if on all uh, neighboring sites and second neighbor sites the states are orthogonal to each other. So the, uh, and and this pattern satisfy that. If you pick up every site, uh, look at all its nearest neighbors and second neighbors, uh, you you always encounter different states. Okay, so that's why it's a uh, it's a frustration free uh, state. And uh, you see that uh, in this uh, state uh, we have a four sublattice. Uh, order, uh, the unit cell becomes two times two, uh, four times larger, uh, and uh, uh, this is a dense wave. Right? It's a spin dense wave. It's also a valley dense wave. Right? So the plus minus represent two valleys, and the arrows represent spins. Um, so th uh, so this is a particular uh, ground state uh, in the degenerate manifold. So the remaining states in the degenerate manifold can be obtained by uh, by uh, rotating the spins uh, of each valley, right? So we can separately rotate all the spins of the in the plus valley and the spins in the minus valley. Right? So and there's, there's a, a manifold of these ground states. So um, so this is a semi-classical uh, state, and one can all, all further analyze the effect of uh, quantum fluctuations at the zero temperature. Uh, and uh, uh, and this is. Uh, Basically, the reduction of the uh, order moments due to quantum fluctuations is plotted here as a function of the ratio of J1, uh, J2 over J1. Right? So you see that when the J2 is above a certain threshold, uh, which is 0.12 around, uh, this dense wave is stabilized against quantum fluctuations. Uh, while if the J2 is smaller than this value, uh, within this uh, 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 analysis, uh, we find that the order moments uh, reduces to zero, so we get a disordered state. Okay. So, uh, the, uh, uh, so this is basically the main uh, result uh, from the analysis of this two optical Hubbard model on the triangle lattice, and uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, so this uh, can be uh, I think compared with uh, experiments. Uh, for example, you know in this state, uh, it's not spin polarized, it's not valley polarized, and uh, this determines the behavior uh, when we apply in-plane magnetic field and, uh, or the out-of-plane magnetic field. Uh, in this system, the in-plane magnetic field couples to the spin. The out-of-plane magnetic field predominantly couples to the orbitals. So uh, because this uh, state is an anti magnetic type of state in spin space and in valley space, uh, we do not expect uh, any uh, uh, polarization. So, uh, so in the presence of external field, uh, the spins will count, for example. Uh, so this this can uh, be compared with future experiments. <coughs> so um, there are also many uh, open questions. Uh, for example, uh, what is the nature of this disorder phase? Right. So uh, within the semi-classical approach, we are not able to determine uh, the nature of this state. So it's an open question. Uh, and in this two of them have a model. You know what happens when we dope the system away from this insulating region? Uh, does this give rise to supernativity? And if it does, what kind of supernativity state? All these are. Uh, open questions. So, uh, so with this, uh, let me just uh, summarize uh, that uh, uh, basically, you know, these are the three topics uh, covered: uh, the topology and the quantum geometry uh, in two D materials. And uh, there, uh, the key player uh, is this direct point. Right? Uh, when direct point opens up a gap, it leads to various topological states. And uh, direct point also, uh, massive direct point also gives rise to barrier curvature, and uh, and that can be uh, probed. Uh, that leads to uh, non-spoil effect, non-linear spoil effect. Uh, in the case of these uh, Mori materials, uh, the system uh, at uh, uh, half filling, at quarter filling, they always have a Fermi surface uh, instead of a Fermi point. But uh, interestingly, that uh, uh, when the whole singularity is uh, near the Fermi energy, uh, one can uh, uh, look at the physics, the vicinity of these saddle points that allows us to formulate the problem in terms of field theory. And uh, uh, without any intrinsic scale, the system becomes a, a super metal, which is at the border of ferromagnetism, you know, uh, uh, um, 
charge order and etc. So I like to think of this metal as uh, as a uh, intermediate uh, fixed point right, that governs the behavior of the system in a wide temperature range. So as you lower the temperature, uh, the non-Italian soup metal may become unstable. Uh, it may give rise to uh, a new uh, states, temperature breaking states, or the uh, non-Italian soup metal can remain metallic down to zero temperature, uh, and that leads to a non-Fermi liquid, uh, which which we can uh, address in a controlled way. Uh, I've briefly discussed that the uh, strong coupling limit, uh, where uh, the uh, you know, very much like the Hubbard model, uh, but now uh, because of the presence of two values, uh, the, there exist uh, two orbitals at least, and this multi-orbital uh, uh, leads to uh, new physics. So, for example, in the triangle lattice, we get a frustration-free uh, 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 ground state at quarter billy. Okay, thank you. Multi-orbital hubbard physics right. in your effective model. Right. Seems like we get a, a large degeneracy at the end of the day. Correct. There's a degenerate ground state manifold, right? Yeah, right. At zero so temperature. Yeah. Do we like can we live it by like introduce like by considering like higher order term and stuff? Oh yeah, that's an excellent question. So, for example, uh, there is a uh, <coughs> when we look at the interactions. Here we are using the, uh, the uh, Hubble induction that only depends on the a number of electrons, right? But one can further include the exchange induction between the two values, right? Uh, the uh, S dot S, and that exchange induction uh, would actually uh, reduce this SU two cross SU two symmetry to just a single SU two. Right? So when the exchange induction is present, there's only a global spin rotation symmetry, but there's no uh, spin rotation symmetry within each value. So this uh, Probably, although I haven't, we haven't looked at it carefully, that's probably would lock the orientation of spins uh, of the plus values and minus values relative to each other. Yeah, so right, that's a good question. Uh, but, uh, I, but the largest interaction in the system is the, uh, 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 the Hubbard interaction. Yeah. And, and actually, that is a general comment uh, I'm going to make that uh, uh, because in these systems, in these Mori systems, the electron density is very low. Uh, so uh, in the low density system, the coulomb induction is long range. Right? So they are the uh, strongest induction. It's in the same way that when we analyze quantum Hall problems right, at low density, the induction, the dominant induction we first consider is coulomb induction. So in my opinion, that uh, uh, in the, all these Mori materials, the leading order question is uh, what is the, uh, you know, what, how do you handle coulomb induction? Uh, the coulomb induction in the main be screened by the metallic gates, uh, but still. Uh, they are much larger than the uh, short-range interactions, but that only is present when two electrons are close, very close to each other. Right? Because on average, electrons uh, stay pretty far away from each other. So the largest interaction is Coulomb or screen Coulomb interaction. Yeah. Uh, even the framework of the interaction between the two orbitals is not but interaction. Uh, when you do the expansion, for example, there should be some term like uh, something that is an analogous to S dot S cross S, like we <coughs> through all this. Track. Oh, you mean the uh, yeah the three side. Yeah. Right. That's a good question. Uh, yeah. You mean uh, when uh, T over U is not too small. Yeah. So one need to uh, take into account three side exchange. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah, that's right. I think that's right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's a good point. Have you considered that? No, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. So this is really the strong coupling limit when you know you assume that T over U is very small. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in the super metal uh, right. divergent density right. states, the, so the thermal power should be huge. Right. Yeah. This is exactly what we are thinking about. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's what we are thinking. Yeah. And do you know? Have you estimated how? In no. No. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, usually thermal power is, depends on the disorder. I think to calculate thermal power, uh, so that requires you know dealing with the presence of disorder. But but I totally agree with you that this is yeah, a from the entropy density point of view. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that in some limit, in some limit, I think that there is some formula for thermal power, 
right? Without any external magnetic field, which uh, is uh, thermodynamic, in, uh, purely reduces to thermodynamic quantities. Uh, but but it's, I haven't. Yeah, we can discuss it. Yeah, but this is an excellent point that the, the usual uh, Van Hoff singularity uh, is symmetric, E minus E symmetric. So if your Fermi energy is right there, right, then there's no thermal power. But in this case, we have a divergent density state, but it's also asymmetric, right, which is already seen in the STM. Uh, uh, SCM data, right? If you just look at them, right? If you just look at this, right? With your, with your, with your eye, you can see that, right? The peak is asymmetric with respect to its center. Yeah. So, uh, so you should have interesting thermal power. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah. If we look at one of the spin in a random valley, right. so four of the spins around it are just uh, anti parallel and two of them are parallel. Right. So, will this induce any uh, distortion for this triangle? Yeah, actually, that's right. So, if you take this ground state, right, you can see that, for example, the rotation symmetry is broken. Yeah. Uh, if you look at uh, you know, the plus valleys right, and the minus valleys, they form uh, alternating stripes. So the relation symmetry is broken, so you should couple to the string. Yeah, then yeah. it's not a perfect triangle Correct. in two opposite directions. Yeah. So in other words, this ground state breaks the three four rotation symmetry. Yeah. But if but if every bond is in its ground state, they all have the same energy, so it wouldn't distort necessarily. Uh, so I think the right it would only distort if it was frustrated, right? That some of the bonds uh, were frustrated, right? Yeah, I think the way to reconcile this is that uh, the if we take additional uh, exchange interaction between the values into account, yeah, then the ground state will distort. Yeah, right. yeah. Your basic yeah. model, it right. won't distort. Right, right, right. right. You know, because if it's really frustration-free, right. 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 every bond is uh, happy. Okay. 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 okay, okay, that's a good point. <laughs> yes. yes. So once we take the exchange interaction into account, then you can see that, uh, for example, uh, this direction and these other directions are not equivalent. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. For that. Another question, yeah, yes. which is uh, yesterday, Fang Wang was talking about uh, valley ferromagnets, and right. I, I actually forget which which right, right, that's which moray material right, right. that so, yeah, was. How yes, does yes. that fit with this? It's yes, yes, yes. Obvious, excellent, right? excellent. Yeah. So, uh, so in this system, uh, uh, the behavior is really depends on the uh, electric field. Uh, so, as Fang Wang said, uh, there are two regimes where electric field is in plus direction and minus direction. Okay. And the churning slater, uh, which uh, comes from the presumably comes from the uh, the valid number of the uh, within each valley, uh, that only occurs on the one direction of electric field, while uh, everything I'm talking about here today is the other direction. So this is in the case where there's no turn number. No turn, no turn number. Yeah. And when you have right. the turn number, right. You need a different. Upper Completely model. different. And then, in fact, if there's a turn number that it's impossible to construct oh, a single you band. Make the one year orbital. Yeah, it cannot make a single band. And that's uh, where he had the valley ferromagnet. Exactly. Okay. And uh, okay. actually, uh, one way. So it's to, the same material, just a different. Same material. material. So this is a very fascinating system. Yeah. So okay. now, uh, one way to understand, sort of uh, intuitively to <coughs> think about two different regimes, the following: uh, if you have this. Uh, uh, Oh, yeah, we can see here. Yeah, so uh, the stratigraphing has three layers, right? And HBN is, uh, let's say, uh, a couple to the uh, top layer. And then, when you apply electric field, you can pull electrons in stratigraphing either towards HBN or away from HBN. So when it's towards HBN, then that's the regime where it's no turn number because the electrons uh, strongly feel the presence of the HBN potential, so they just got stuck into these AA regions. While if the electric field pull, that push the electron away from that, uh, that interface, uh, that um, amazingly leads to the valid number. Yeah. Although, you know, as Fong said yesterday, there's also a very good discussion. I didn't know, I realized before that there's a still question that you know, the turn number, observed turn number is two, while the valid number from the single part calculation is three. So, so the, the origin is still, I think, uh, somewhat open. Yeah. Okay, uh, without, yeah. with that, uh, uh, but join me in thanking uh, Professor Fu for his uh, stimulating lectures. <laughs>